Hello and welcome to HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 testing labs across the United States. Today we're taking a deep dive into two areas that are absolutely critical in the fight against HIV right here in the U.S. We'll be looking at some exciting new developments in HIV vaccine research, and also exploring the continued importance of the HIV testing methods that we have available to us right now. Yes, that's right. We've got some really fascinating research findings to dig into, and also um, a news report about a potentially really significant step forward in vaccine development. It is an exciting time. So in this deep dive, our mission is really to help you understand the potential future of HIV prevention that's being offered by this uh, this novel molecule, but also to underscore why current HIV testing remains absolutely vital for diagnosis prevention and management right now in the U.S. Yes, that's a great way to put it. Okay, so first let's jump into this vaccine research. You know, for decades, creating a truly effective HIV vaccine has felt like this like this massive puzzle. It really has. And one of the biggest pieces missing has been finding a way around HIV's incredibly clever way of protecting itself. It's sort of like it has a sugar coating, right? Precisely. HIV is like a master escape artist. Mm -hmm. And it's wearing this very clever disguise, this dense layer of sugar molecules called a glycan shield. Yeah. And the shield essentially masks the virus from your immune system, making it really difficult for your body to recognize it as a threat. Wow. These sugars are attached to a protein called GP120, which forms the outer layer of the virus, and it creates this almost impenetrable barrier. So, so how on earth do researchers even begin to target something that looks so much like our own cells? Right. And that's where this new research from the University of Maryland and Duke University comes in. And from what I've read in these sources, it seems like a pretty innovative approach. It is quite innovative. What these scientists have done is they've designed a protein sugar vaccine candidate, and it has a very specific target mm -hmm. to train your immune system to finally see and react to this glycan shield. And the strategy involves creating a molecule that mimics a specific protein sugar component of this shield. So, so the, the reports that you shared with me mentioned that this protein fragment they're using actually comes from GP120 itself. Yes. So it's the very protein that's covered in all these sugars on the outer layer of the virus. It is, it's like fighting fire with fire in a way. Yeah. The GP120 protein, as we said, is heavily glycosylated, which means it has all these sugar molecules attached. And as you mentioned, the real challenge is that these sugars look very similar to sugars that are found naturally in the human body. Right. So it's like trying to train your body to attack something that it thinks is a normal part of itself. So it's, it's almost like this vaccine candidate is trying to show the immune system a kind of wanted poster. Yeah. of this familiar looking sugar shield. That's a great analogy. Hoping that it will finally be able to recognize it as the enemy. So how does this actually work? I mean, how does it actually achieve that? Well, the idea is this, by presenting this very carefully designed mimic of the sugar shield, which is linked to a protein fragment, the vaccine can encourage the body to start producing antibodies. And these antibodies are specifically tailored to target these sugar molecules on the HIV virus. Okay. So the hope is to generate a very precise and effective immune response against this part of the virus that was previously hidden. And the initial results that they've seen from the animal studies have been pretty encouraging. They have been quite encouraging. I mean, they've tested this on rabbits so far. Yes, that's right. According to one of the articles that you shared. That's correct. Um, and it seems like they're finding that this vaccine candidate is stimulating the production of antibodies. And these antibodies are actually designed to attack the sugar shield. Exactly. And there's another really exciting finding. Yeah. These antibodies weren't just effective against one strain of HIV. They were effective against the sugar shields of four different HIV strains. Wow, that could be a real game changer, couldn't it? It could be huge. I mean, because HIV mutates and varies so much. Finding something that could potentially work against multiple versions, that could be a huge step forward. It would be a significant leap forward, potentially bypassing one of HIV's most notorious defenses, its constant mutation. The researchers achieved this by using a sophisticated synthetic chemistry technique. They linked the GP120 fragment with a sugar molecule that's also found across various HIV strains. It was a very strategic design choice. Okay. However, it is important to understand that although these antibodies did bind to the GP120 protein, they didn't actually prevent a live HIV infection in these rabbits during the two-month study. Okay, so it sounds like there's still work to do. Okay. But the fact that they were able to get that antibody response against multiple strains and in such a short time frame, 
That's still a really significant development, right? It is absolutely a significant development. Mm -hmm. And Lejumar, I'm one of the researchers on the project, he emphasized this. He said that getting a substantial antibody response against the sugar shield in such a relatively short time is incredibly encouraging. And he called it a crucial initial step in finally being able to target this shield, which has been a major obstacle for such a long time. And this research was recently published in the journal Cell Chemical Biology. Right. According to the report in Kalinga TV, the findings were published on March 23, 2025. So where does the research go from here? What are the next steps to try and translate this into a vaccine that could eventually be used in humans? Well, the ultimate goal, of course, is a human vaccine. Yeah. But the immediate next step for the research team is to conduct studies in non-human primates, specifically monkeys, because their immune systems are much more similar to ours than rabbits. Okay. And these studies will provide a much clearer picture of how this vaccine candidate might behave in humans. One of the things I was reading in these articles mentioned that there's a possibility of combining this approach with other vaccine strategies as well, a little further down the line. That's right. Future research might explore combining this vaccine candidate with other approaches to see if they can create an even stronger and more durable protective effect. That's pretty interesting. It's a very promising avenue for exploration. But there's no specific timeline yet for when those primate studies will begin. Not that we're aware of at this point. It's pretty amazing to think that this research is the culmination of over a decade of work. You know, all dedicated to understanding and mimicking these incredibly complex sugar structures that the virus uses to protect itself. It really is a testament to the dedication and the persistence of the researchers in this field. Yeah. And it's important to remember that this is a collaborative effort. It involves several major research institutions, including Rockefeller University, Caltech, and of course, it's receiving crucial financial support from the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Well, this is definitely some exciting progress on the vaccine front. But like we said at the very beginning, even with this potential on the horizon, HIV testing in the U.S. right now is still absolutely essential. It is undeniably essential. The possibility of a vaccine is an incredibly promising development for the future. But right now, we need to focus on what we can do today to diagnose infections, prevent new ones, and effectively manage the virus in those who are already living with HIV. Yeah. And all of that starts with testing. So for our listeners who might not be completely up to speed, what are the main types of HIV tests that are currently available to people in the US? Well, there are three main types of tests that you should be aware of. Right. Antibody tests, antigen antibody tests, and nucleic acid tests, which are also known as NATs. Okay. Antibody tests look for the antibodies that your body produces in response to an HIV infection. And these tests can be done using blood either drawn from a vein or through a finger prick. And they can also be done using oral fluid or even urine. And, and there are rapid antibody tests available. Yes, there are. They can give you results in less than 30 minutes. That's right. And there's also the Orquick self-test which provides results in about 20 minutes in the comfort of your own home. Yeah. And then of course there are the lab-based blood tests, which might take a bit longer. Okay, so then there's also the antigen antibody tests. Yeah. How are those different from the antibody tests you just described? So antigen antibody tests detect both the HIV antibodies that your body produces and a specific HIV protein called the P24 antigen. And this P24 antigen can actually be present in your blood even before your body has developed any detectable antibodies. Oh, wow. So these tests are commonly used for routine testing, and they're available as rapid finger stick options that provide relatively quick results, but they're also available as lab-based venous blood tests. Okay, and finally, there are the NAPs, the nucleic acid tests. Yes, sir. These are the ones that can detect HIV the earliest after an infection, right? They, they are, that's correct. NATs look for the actual genetic material of the virus, the HIV RNA in a blood sample that's drawn from a vein. Right. And because they're detecting the virus itself and not just the body's response to it, NATs can identify an infection earlier than either antibody or antigen antibody tests. Oh. They're also used to measure the viral load, which is the amount of virus that's present in your blood. And they're really helpful for people who may have been very recently exposed or those who are experiencing some very early symptoms. And they're also used to confirm positive results from the screening tests. Okay, so there are all these different tests available. What are some key things that people should know about? You know, yeah. How quickly they'll get their results, how accurate the tests are, yeah. and how easy it is to actually get tested. 
Well, when it comes to turnaround times, those can vary quite a bit. As we mentioned, some of the antibody and antigen antibody tests, particularly those rapid finger stick and oral fluid options, can give you results in about 30 minutes. The self-test is even quicker. But the lab-based tests, which usually use venous blood samples and gnats, they do typically take a little bit longer, usually a few days, because they need to be processed in a laboratory setting. Okay. It's also important to keep in mind that if you do get a positive result from a rapid test, it's important to have that confirmed with a more specific lab-based test. Okay. And what about accuracy? Accuracy is, of course, a major concern. The accuracy rates for HIV tests are generally very high, especially once you're past the window period. But this window period does vary depending on the type of test that you take. For antibody tests, it can be anywhere from 23 to 90 days. Rapid antigen antibody tests that use a finger prick, they have a window period of about 18 to 90 days while the lab-based antigen antibody tests that use venous blood samples, they can usually detect HIV a bit sooner, typically within 18 to 45 days. And then gnats have the shortest window period, ranging from 10 to 33 days. So if you do test negative within that window period after a potential exposure, it is recommended that you get retested again after the window period has closed to be absolutely sure. Yeah, that makes sense. It's always best to err on the side of caution. Yeah. And it's worth noting that some lab tests are incredibly sensitive and specific, like the ADVIA Centaur assay, which has really impressive rates of around 98.4% sensitivity and about 99.7% specificity. Wow, those are good numbers. They are very reassuring and access to testing has thankfully really improved over the years. Where can people in the U.S. get tested these days? Well, access is much better than it used to be. You can get tested at your healthcare provider's office, at hospitals, at community health centers. You can even get tested at mobile testing units. And there are mail-in testing programs that are available in certain areas. That's fantastic. And of course, self-tests are readily available for purchase at pharmacies and online. Oh, wow. And the CDC has a wonderful initiative called Together Take Me Home, which provides free HIV self-test kits. That's a great program. It really is. In fact, the CDC actually recommends routine opt-out HIV screening for everyone between the ages of 13 and 64 in healthcare settings. So if you're looking for testing locations near you, resources like gettested.cdc.gov and hiv.gov are excellent places to start. Bringing it back to the vaccine research that we were just discussing, even if this promising molecule eventually leads to a successful vaccine that's widely available, why will HIV testing still be so important in the U.S.? That is an excellent question. And it's a question that a lot of people might be asking. You know, you might think that a vaccine would make testing obsolete, right? but that's not the case at all. Testing will remain crucial for several very important reasons. First, we'll still need to be able to diagnose HIV in people who, for whatever reason, may not have been vaccinated. Second, it's very unlikely that any vaccine will be 100% effective. Yeah. So there will always be a possibility of breakthrough infections. Additionally, many people may have already been infected with HIV before a vaccine even becomes available. And ongoing monitoring and surveillance of the epidemic will continue to rely heavily on testing data. Okay. And in the early stages of a vaccine rollout, we might need testing to help us distinguish between a vaccine-induced immune response and an actual HIV infection. Oh, wow. And of course, for those individuals who choose not to be vaccinated, testing will remain absolutely vital. And it's important to remember that even if a vaccine does significantly reduce the risk of HIV infection, early diagnosis of any breakthrough infections will still be crucial for ensuring that people can start treatment promptly and to prevent further transmission of the virus. That makes perfect sense. It sounds like a vaccine would be another incredibly powerful tool but it's certainly not going to replace all the other tools we have. Absolutely not. It's an addition to the toolkit, not a replacement. And early and regular testing has so many benefits, regardless of what happens with this vaccine. It does. Knowing your HIV status is really the foundation for both individual and public health. A significant number of new HIV infections are actually transmitted by people who don't know that they have the virus. So early diagnosis is really important because it allows individuals to start antiretroviral therapy sooner which leads to better long-term health, a longer lifespan, and importantly, a dramatically reduced risk of transmitting the virus to others. Undetectable equals untransmittable, or UU, as we often say. And for those who test negative and are at risk testing can be a gateway to accessing pre-EP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it's highly effective at preventing HIV infection. It's also extremely important for pregnant women to get tested. 
to prevent transmitting HIV to their babies. Yeah, that's really important. And from a public health perspective, routine HIV screening is a cost-effective way to identify undiagnosed infections and to link people to the care and prevention services that they need. So what are the CDC's general recommendations for HIV testing? When should people be getting tested? Well, the CDC recommends that everyone between the ages of 13 and 64 should get tested for HIV at least once as part of their routine health care. Okay. And individuals who are at a higher risk should get tested more frequently, perhaps annually or even every three to six months. And that's particularly true for sexually active gay and bisexual men. Some risk factors to consider include things like Having unprotected sex, having multiple sexual partners injecting drugs or sharing needles, exchanging sex for money or drugs, and having other sexually transmitted infections. But even if you don't consider yourself to be at high risk, it's still a good idea to get tested just to know your status. And repeat testing is really crucial after any potential exposure to HIV. And keep in mind the window period of the specific test that you're using. Okay, so to bring everything together, what would you say is the key takeaway from our deep dive today? Well, the key takeaway is this. The research on this novel molecule offers a really exciting glimpse into the future of HIV prevention through vaccination. But right here and now, early and regular HIV testing in the U.S. remains absolutely critical for you, for diagnosis, for preventing further transmission, and for managing the virus effectively. It's a long and complex journey in vaccine research, but it's so encouraging to see these kinds of advancements happening. And it's also a good reminder that, you know, our commitment to ending the HIV epidemic needs to be comprehensive, and it involves a multi-pronged approach, with testing remaining a really vital cornerstone for all of us. Precisely scientific advancements like this vaccine research, when combined with our proactive engagement in HIV testing and the prevention strategies that are available to us today, those are the things that will ultimately contribute to the broader goal of public health and well-being. Within the context of HIV here in the United States, that's a really important point to and on, I want to encourage all of you listening to think about your own HIV testing status and to explore the resources that we've mentioned. For more information about testing options and prevention strategies that are available to you, thank you all so much for taking this deep dive with us. And as we consider this potential future of prevention alongside the importance of knowing your status today, it really makes you wonder, how will our collective approach to ending the HIV epidemic evolve over the next decade? And what role will each of us play in that future?